our, our speaker. But it kind of fits, if you know Bruce Bickle. Uh, Bruce uh, spent years uh, on parents' council when his, uh, he had two children here, two kids, uh, at Westmont. And then uh, he's now uh, on our board of trustees. Uh, he, he went to the University of Redlands where he majored in theater arts. Huh? Uh, with the intent of becoming a stand-up comic. <laughs> now, that's cool. But the next step is, is absolutely incomprehensible. Wasn't working out as a stand-up comic, so he went to law school. And he's now an attorney. <laughs> and that's just, that's just transformative, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, uh, but Bruce shows his, uh, his wonderful sense of humor in everything he does, and, and his sharp wit, and his love for the Word of God. He, uh, he's, he's, he's been called one of the super lawyers of Central California. But Bruce is the first to say, uh, he is an attorney, so he can pay the bills, so he can do ministry. And he's written some 40 books on the Christian life and uh, speaks. He's a wonderfully gifted communicator and a dear brother in Christ. And Bruce, it's been too long since we've had you at Westmont. Let's, let's welcome him in the name of Christ. So I was called last May, second week in May, and asked to speak in chapel today. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, this guy has had 10 months to prepare. This is going to be good. <laughs> I'm telling you, don't get your hopes up. What I want to talk to you about is the difference between living with Christ as preeminent in your life and living with Christ as predominant in your life. And, and Brad, if it's going to goof up the video, then don't do it. But otherwise, if you could bring up the gym lights a little bit, uh, that would be great. Okay, so God as, because I just see Gail's eyes and teeth glowing in the dark here. It's kind of like the Cheshire clack cat. Oh, that's much, that's a great relief. <laughs> All right, so when you are living with Christ as preeminent, you're living as God designed you to be. You know you're supposed to be Christ preeminent in all things, right? You know, you can see it on the Westmont souvenir napkins on sale in the bookstore. You see it everywhere. But that's how God designed it. So that you would flourish. So that you could full, feel the full experience of the Holy Spirit working in your life. St. Ignatius, a second century theologian, said, God is glorified when humans are living fully. John 10.10, 10, Christ came so that we could have life and have it abundantly. When you are living with Christ as predominant in your life, you are preeminent. Oh, you may fill your time with other things and not think that you are preeminent, but you're preeminent in your life if God is not. Romans 6 says that we choose who we are going to follow. We're going to follow God or we're going to follow ourselves. And when we are living with Christ as predominant, he may show up in our activities and in our conduct and in our vocabulary, but he doesn't have control of our lives. Think about it. You don't even have to be a Christian on the campus here at Westmont and God is prominent in your life, right? You're in chapel three times a week. Your faculty members may pray at the start of class. You're surrounded with ministry activities. It could be so easy for you to coast through life off the lives of others in whom Christ is preeminent that you can fool yourself. When you're preeminent in your life and God is only predominant, it's, um, it's a deceptive, insidious sin because it's almost imperceptible as it happens. Philip Yancey says, there are two things that Jesus is not. He's not boring and he's not predictable. But when we're preeminent and we move God off of the throne of our life and put him in this little box that we can control, he becomes boring and he, he becomes predictable because we've only given him a certain latitude to work in our life one, one commentator has said in talking about this subject has said we've taken the lion of Judah and we've declawed him 
and we've certified him as a household pet. We've made God tame in our lives because we want to be preeminent. Look at um, John uh, 10, 10. The second part of the verse is the verse that we always know. Christ says, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But the first part of the verse talks about Satan's victory when we live as preeminent. The first part of John 10, 10 says, the thief's purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy. Let me give you some examples of how this plays out. If I read John 3, 16, when I'm preeminent, and God is only predominant in my life. I read John 3.16 this way. For God so loved Bruce Bickle that he gave his only begotten son so that if Bruce Bickle believes in him, he shall not perish and have everlasting life. Who's the star of that verse? Bruce Bickle! Because if Bruce believes on God, Bruce shall have everlasting life. Way to go, Bruce! But when God is preeminent, and I read John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. And through God's grace, little Bruce Bickle and the other children of God get to participate in that process That God would be so gracious to us to give us the opportunity to be part of his redemptive plan for the world. If I get emotional, don't let that throw you. It doesn't throw me. It just happens. (laughs) Um, Let me give you another example. What happens when we are preeminent in our life and God is only prominent? we have a kind of spiritual arrogance that takes over in our life. Because we don't have the influence of the Holy Spirit making us humble and grateful and understanding God's grace because the Holy Spirit isn't, isn't really ministering in our life because we've cut God out of that. So we walk around. We're so proud of our doctrine because we know that. You know. Let me tell you, doctrine is essential, but it's not sufficient. We need to have God as preeminent in our lives because we walk around looking at other Christians who aren't even pretending that that God's predominant. And and, and we look down on them and we act like we've hit an inside the park home run forgetting that God through his graciousness has allowed us to be born on third base. Do do you see the distinction? Let me tell you about... um, the message that Steve Jobs gave to the graduating class at Stanford in 2005 because I think this is a a danger particularly for all of you. Now, so remember, he's speaking to Stanford grads. And, And I went to law school with a lot of Stanford grads. You can always tell a Stanford grad. You just can't tell them much. So he tells... He's, this, is, this is his speech, to, to, you know, in the commencement. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. In other words, find what you are passionate in life and do that. And I'm telling you, be passionate about God. Do not be passionate about your work. Because if you are spending all of your time and energy looking for that career, that occupation that you're going to be passionate about, you've moved God out of the role of preeminence in your life. But let me tell you this. If you make God preeminent in your life, and if you are passionate about him, you are going to be passionate about every single thing in your life, including your work. Because you're going to have this great understanding that you are right where God wants you to be. 
Let me give you my uh, backstory. So, um, I, I'm, I'm passionate about this because this is the area that I've struggled in with my life for years. And, and sometimes I do it better, God's preeminent, and then I'm predominant. But you know, over the, the, the past years, it, it seems that God is preeminent less and I'm predominant more. So, sometimes it's a daily kind of exchange. But it kept seeing that it was more and more this way. So um, it got to the point where God, I'm sure, was saying, how am I going to get Bruce's attention? You know, I'm going to have to do something drastic like kill him. So that's what he did. June 14th, 2007, I've been working in Central California. The air was particularly bad. I called my doctor and said, I have, my lungs have been irritated for three days. I know I don't have an appointment. Can I come in and see you? Just have you check my lungs. He said, stop talking, take an aspirin, get to the hospital now. I asked my secretary, do we have aspirin? No. I said, you look busy, you keep working. I'm going to drive myself to the hospital. I go to the hospital, I call my wife, who was actually up in Seattle at the time, and I said, that doggone doctor just doesn't want to see me today. And he's forcing me to go to the ER. I'm going to spend three hours there, you know, just so they can give me some little bronchial kind of thing. I walk in the doors of the emergency room into the, into the reception area, and I fell over dead. I am told that I was flatlined for three minutes, which apparently was the time it took them to find an extension cord so they could wheel the crash cart out to the reception area. Here is the sad thing about my unfortunate and momentary death. God wasn't able to penetrate me at all. I didn't change. It was still this. But God loved me so much, he continued to pursue me. It was relentless. And for the past four years, I have been God's pinata. He has me hanging from a branch and he's beaten me with a stick. And no candy's coming out, and he's keep beating me. <laughs> and he messed with everything in my life except my marriage and my kids. Everything I touched broke until I got to the point where I was so desperate. I had to make God preeminent because I realized I have nothing except God. He's all I have. And then as I realize that, and as God is preeminent, and I'm starting to, 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 to flourish in the, in the least little way, I go from God is all I have to, you know, I think, I think God is all I need. And then as God in his great graciousness continues to minister in my life, then I'm, I get to this point where I'm saying, God is, God is all I want. What a great possession that is here's my concern for you my concern for you as your spiritual older brother is that you are here surrounded by all of God in his prominence and so it would be easy for you to coast through life never feeling the thrill of having him be preeminent in your life I am not really worried that most of you are going to fall away from the faith. I think you've been rooted and grounded in such great basics. That's why we trustees are so excited about what God can do in and through you. We pray for you often. We love you. We don't know you, although that may be what makes it easier to love you, but, um, <laughs> but we're praying for you. Here's my concern for you. I do not want you to wake up 30 years from now and have a faith that is boring and mundane and lifeless. They bought a new clock just for me today. Um, so I'm going to edit this on my feet. Here, here's my suggestion for you. Learn to, to speak God's language. I think God only speaks one language. What does, uh, if, if your professors disagree with that, you, you listen to them. But in my humble and correct opinion, one language. 
What do you call a person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call a person who speaks one language? American. Yeah, American. That's what somebody said. That's what said. Listen, listen to this. I want to read um, uh, 1 Peter. Yeah. 1 Peter, quoting Leviticus. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Living with you is preeminent. But now you must be holy in everything you do just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. That's God speaking in Leviticus. Be holy because I am holy. And I think about that and I say, who are we kidding? Does God take perverse pleasure in asking us to do something that he knows we can't do? Or at least we can't sustain? No. Is God asking us to do it because that's what's required for our salvation? No. Our righteousness is imputed to us for, for what Christ did for us. Well, why is God so concerned about us acting holy? Because that's the language that God speaks. God speaks holiness. And, and if we're living with ourselves as preeminent, or if, we, if we're engaged in some sin that we think is innocuous and immaterial and insignificant, and so we've built up a callus toward it, we've really built up a callus toward God's holiness, and we can't communicate with him. And as I... I've been kind of coming to this understanding, particularly in the last 10 months, because God wanted me to have something to say to you. I read through the Beatitudes, and I see, you know, uh, blessed are the poor, they'll inherit the earth. You know, uh, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed is the so-and-so for, you know, such and such. Although it's said with more grandeur and majesty. In the, you know, but, but then, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the righteous. Blessed are those who pursue holiness. Why? Because they will see God. When we speak the language of holiness, God becomes real in our life. James 5, you know, the, the fervent prayer of a righteous person, a holy person, achieves much. Listen to this passage from Isaiah. This is the call of Isaiah. It was the year of King Uzziah uh, that he died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a, he, God, not Uzziah, he was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim having six wings. The two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, with two they flew, and they were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, the way you really emphasize something was to repeat it. So in the passage about bringing the Israelites, bringing gold for the temple, when the writer wanted to say they brought the purest, the finest gold, the text says they brought gold, gold. And when a writer of the Old Testament was talking about the guy falling into this pit, he wanted to say it was a deep pit. It was a really deep pit. So in the text it says, he fell into a pit pit. And so here the seraphim are calling out, not just Lord God Almighty is holy. He's not just holy, holy. He's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So, um, a few years ago, when my son was a Westmont student, he came to me in the summer and said, Dad, I'm thinking of getting a tattoo. And I said, well, uh, you know, it's a generational thing. I said, um, I, not, not for my generation, but it's, it's for, for yours. And I have no, you know, qualms about tattoo. I th think it's fine. It's a great, you know, uh, act of self-expressionism. And he said, but Matt, with you, you know, you haven't, you haven't experienced the fullness of the potential of your maturity. 
and I'm afraid that you would get a tattoo and then want to, to shift around and change. And do, so I am asking you this. Don't get a tattoo until after you graduate from Westmont. Because in our household, after you graduate from college, you're immediately off all parental subsidies. I said, so then you're in charge. But while I'm paying the bills, I'm asking you not to do it, just out of a display of respect for me. So then I was on a cross-country kind of book tour, and I'm traveling from Chicago to Seattle. There is not much between Chicago and Seattle. <laughs> that plays into my story. And I get a call from my wife. And she says, Matt got a tattoo. And I said, no, he didn't. It's one of those fake ones. He, she said, that's what he told me. But it's not. I checked. It's a real tattoo. And I immediately got livid. How, how dare he get a tattoo? I said, I'll be in Seattle in two days. I'll fly home. Do not punish him. I want the pleasure. <laughs> so as I'm driving through the Dakotas, and through Montana, that you can't even get radio stations. And I, how dare he do this to me? After all I have done for him, he, could, he disrespects me in this way. And I've never been in a tattoo parlor, and I'm figuring he went in there, and there's some long needle. And I see him on this gurney kind of thing, and I see this, you know, giving this tattoo, and, and with each prod of this long syringe. He's grimacing and he's saying, I'm defying my father. I'm defying my father. I'm defying my father. <laughs> Within a matter of hours, I had determined he owned his car, but I, was, I paid the insurance. I was going to stop the insurance on his car, which basically means he wouldn't be able to drive. I was going to not pay his tuition at Westmont, which means he'd have to get out of Westmont. He wasn't welcome to come back home. Can you tell I felt strongly about this? <laughs> because it was so wrong for him to defy me in that way. And I'm driving in the silence of just my own fury. And the only time in my life God spoke audibly to me. And he said, what about your tattoos? And I said, God, you know me. My skin is un as unblemished as the new fallen snow. <laughs> and he said, what about your tattoos? Because every time you sin, you are defying your father. Every time that you take over your life and you are living it, preeminence in your life and you've relegated me to prominence, although I didn't know the alliteration of the words at the time, you are defying me. Matt is so lucky God spoke to me in this way. <laughs> and I did get home. And I did punish him, but hardly. And I, but I made him listen to my little mini sermon right on the spot. About, we are so ungrateful to the Lord. When here's the Lord God, holy Holy, holy. And we underestimate his holiness. And we elevate our own importance. So for us, it doesn't seem like a big deal. So in my mini little punishment of Matt, I said, Matt, what were you thinking? He said, Dad, I wasn't really thinking. He said, I, I didn't think it would be a big deal to you. Holy, holy, holy. Why am I sinning? Why am I living with me in charge? Because I don't think it's a big deal to God. Uh, the, 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 these sins that I keep committing, they're, they're so minor. He certainly has got grace to, to cover those. Holy, holy, holy. Let me tell you the irony, the great irony. I didn't even ask to see Matt's tattoo. It, it really was really kind of irrelevant. I mean, after I'd gone through this spiritual catharsis. Tattoo was about this big. It was a Christian fish superimposed over the cross. It looked 
like this. <laughs> because this tattoo means something to me now. Of course, mine was put on this morning with a Sharpie. But... Uh, <laughs> There is nothing I enjoy more than seeing Matt's tattoo. Live with Christ as preeminent. Do not fall into the temptation of living him with merely being predominant in your life. Come into an understanding of God's holiness so that you can be in communion with him so that you can experience that abundant life you have to learn the taste and the feel and the joy of that abundant life so that when you don't have it when you've done this you'll know the difference and you'll long for it job said remember job chapter one god picked on him because he was righteous right so he was already pure of heart pursuing after god Job goes through that whole experience. And after it was all over, he said, before I had heard of God, but now I've seen God. I would not trade the last four, four I did not enjoy the four years that I've spent, but I would not trade it. Because I moved from God is all I have to God is all I need to God is all I want. And he and I are back on track. Oh, you know, there's still this, but, but the, the timing is not as of long duration as it used to be. And I am praying for you that you will come into an appreciation of our holy, holy, holy God Almighty. Let's pray. Lord, you know how much I care for these students. And you know I don't know them, but they're my Christian brothers and sisters. And Lord, I do not want them to wake up 30 years from now with you boring and predictable and mundane in their lives. May they use their Westmont years as an opportunity to get to know you so intimately that they will never be satisfied for themselves to be preeminent in their lives. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, you're dismissed.